Hey, it's Clara Anfo here, and as part of Live Lounge Month, we kicked off proceedings at 606 Studios in LA, the home of Foo Fighters. So they started a month of live lounges with an exclusive performance for us at Radio One, and as well as letting us know around the studios, they built the actual log cabin from the video for their new single for us to sit down in and have a chat. Here's what went down. So I'm here with Pat, Chris, Nate, Rami, Taylor, and Dave, Foo Fighters. Hello. Good morning. And first things first, thank you very much for welcoming us into your home, into your studio. What does this place mean to you, 606? Do you remember the first time you laid eyes on this space? Yeah, well, you know, we, a long time ago, about 20 years ago, we built a studio in my basement in my house when I was living in Virginia. And we made a couple records there. We made uh, the Nothing Left to Lose record with Learn to Fly and stuff. Then the next record, All My Life, was on that. We did those in my basement. And I mean, it was really like this dirty little basement with sleeping bags nailed to the walls and stuff. And then everybody wound up moving out of here and we thought it would be cool if we had like our own headquarters. So we found this place, we designed it to be a studio and it really literally is like, it's like the Death Star. Like when you, when we go on tour, the truck pulls up right over there you put everything into the truck and then we hit the road and then we come home, we put everything back in the studio and this is it, this is like our home. I've been having a great time in LA so far. These are three things I've noticed. Everybody says, hi, how are you? And I think they mean it. I, I feel it's quite sincere. People really ask you that. People uh, really want to know how your day is. The TV adverts are quite interesting. I have seen uh, boys to men singing to people about- That's right, about yes! insurance. The yes! new insurance thing, it's have you seen hard! it? It's amazing. So your new prescription does have a few side effects. Oh, like what? You're gonna have dizziness, nausea, and sweaty eyelids, and in severe cases, chronic flatulence. So very you know strange. that Sean from Boys to Men sings on a record. He's on your record, which this is the weirdest thing because I, I learned this. It's quite prophetic. So explain to me how he's on your record. Okay, so. There's a song on the record called Concrete and Gold. It's actually the, la the last song on the record, and it's the title track. Yeah. But it's this really kind of heavy, dark, um, big epic song where the choruses explode into this gigantic, uh, almost kind of like Pink Floyd-esque thing that I imagine we w should have a choir. And so we've never recorded a choir before, but the day that we were doing some of the vocals, I was in the parking lot, with my guitar and I was writing out the lyrics. And I look up and I see Sean from Boys to Men walking through the parking lot. And he was there to do like a doo-wop session. I'm like, hey man. And we start talking and he said, what are you doing? I said, oh, we're making a record. But we hadn't told anybody we were making a record yet. So we're making a record. Today we're recording this song that I really wanted there to be a choir on. And I looked at him and I said, did you sing on our record? He's like, are you kidding me? And I'm like, no. He goes, yeah. I said, okay, come in, let me play this track for you. And I was kind of nervous because it's like this really, I mean, it sounds like Black Sabbath or something. And, and he listened to it, he's like, man, I'm into it. And then he went and kind of built a choir by singing like 30 different vocal tracks. It was unbelievable. He's unbelievable. So let's talk about 2017 so far. It's been a bit of a weird year. It's been an intense year. It's been a fun year, I'm sure. What have been your highlights? When, when I'm not in, let's talk about some life you've lived. Taylor. Some what? Some life that you've lived. 2017, what, how's it been for you so far? Um, it's been good. We finished a record, um, which is always the beginning of the next sort of two years of your life. Kind of know your life starts getting planned and you start seeing it down the road and we're going here, then, and there, then. And, and I mean, because like the year before, we didn't really do anything. We wrote a little bit of music, but we just kind of stayed home. So it's, it's eventful. Every year you put out a record, it's like kind of a, a land, like a, a fork in the road or something. So. Well, obviously you had uh, Glastonbury. We need to talk about that. Which was absolutely like huge. I mean, you know, it was, Two years in the making, essentially, because unfortunately, you know, bones get broken, life happens. How was it kind of looking back at that performance? Like, did you watch it back? Do you watch things back or is it once it's done, it's well, done? Well, you know what's funny? I didn't realize that it was going to be on TV all over the world 
I just wasn't thinking or didn't really Hang know. Hang on, let's rewind. You didn't realise no, that your headline performance at Glastonbury was going to be on TV all over No, the I mean, the last time we were at the Glastonbury Festival was like 1998. I think we played at like four o'clock in the afternoon. And it was, it was right. yeah, we didn't have to worry about any cameras, that one. Um, but no, I, I didn't realise that it was just all over the world, you know. So after the show, I was getting texts from people all over the world saying, man, that show was amazing. That was incredible. I'm like, how do you know? You know, and they're like, we just watched it online or something like that. But it was, I mean, when we got there that afternoon, um, we got there maybe at like four o'clock in the afternoon and I looked at the audience and I just knew like, this is gonna, it's gonna be massive. Like, this is gonna be so much fun. And I felt perfectly at ease and comfortable. I wasn't nervous at all. I felt like that field was full of people that have been with us a long time and some people that had never seen us before. And I love that combination because I know that the people that have been with us for a long time are gonna get rowdy. And I know that there's the people that have never seen us before that, you know, kind of has something to prove in a way, you know? Um, but it was nuts. It was, it was nuts. I wanna to talk to you guys about working with uh, Greg Kirsten because he is, you know, pop producer that everybody wants to work with. Adele, Pink, Kelly Clarkson, Sia. He's worked with all of those guys. And now he's worked, he's worked with you guys, a collaboration that people would not expect. How come you guys reached out to him or vice versa? What, what's the story? So Greg is in a band called The Bird and the Bee, right? And they're amazing. And when their first record came out, I heard one of the songs on the radio. It blew my mind and I became obsessed with this record. And I listened to it over and over again, like every day. I was online looking at their like website page, like the tour dates, whatever. And then about four months after that, I was in Hawaii at this restaurant and I looked across the restaurant and I saw him. I didn't know he was a producer. I just knew him from The Bird and the Bee. I'm like, oh my God, that's the guy from The Bird and the Bee. And I ran up to him at dinner with his family and I'm like, I'm really sorry, but I'm such a huge fan. Hang on, so you did the thing that people do to you sometimes. Yes. Right. He was trying to have dinner, man. I know, I couldn't help it, man. I was with his family. Out. I mean, I was obsessed with this dude. And so I'm like, you know, what are you doing here? And I asked him, I said, what's going on with the bird and the bee? And he said, well, we're going to make another record, but I have to finish producing Sia and Adele and all this stuff. And so then I realized like, oh, wow, he's like a heavy producer. So we just hung out for years as friends talking about music. And then when it came time to um, make another record, I thought like, wow, well, I knew that he was more than just like a pop producer. He's like, a, he's a jazz musician. He plays all instruments. He's a studied, brilliant musician um, who's got his own band that I love so much. And then he also makes these crazy huge records. He loves rock, he loves classic rock, he loves punk rock, he loves reggae, he loves jazz. He's just like one of those dudes. And so I imagine like, if we wanna make our freaky record, we, this is the guy we're gonna make our freaky record with. And so I didn't think at first that he would do it because sometimes he just does a couple songs for people. But I was like, oh my God, you know, like would, I wondered if he would make an entire record with us. And he said, yes. And he'd never made a big heavy rock record before. It was his first one. And he, it's amazing what he did. And he did exactly what I hoped he would do. He kind of put that bird in the bee melody over our crazy noise. And it turned out exactly what I hoped it would sound. Well, you hear that in Sky, definitely. Yeah, that's like all the like the big noisy stuff. That's us. The beautiful like orchestration and harmonies. That's Greg. Yeah, and it's all over the record. Uh, Foo Fighters, it's been wonderful to talk to you again. Thank you very much for kicking off the day one of Live Lounge Month. You have set the bar. It is on now. I'm sure all the other artists are going to be quaking in their boots. And I guess we'll be seeing you back in the UK when you tour next.